Oh, what a very special Friday we have because we have a very special guest who's just walked into the studio, and it is an honor to have him here. It's always great when we get a chance to see each other and chat, which thankfully is pretty often, whether it be private shows, public shows, uh, whatever the case may be, uh, various things we've done over the years. Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top is in the house. Good to see you, sir. Eddie Trunk, good to be back in in step. Uh, as you say, uh, we've had the good fortune to uh, cross paths uh, quite frequently. Yeah, we've had some fun times and parties and things like that that you were performing at or I was hosting at with all sorts of uh, qu- quite a mix of different people which is something that I thought about when I was getting ready to talk to you today because you're here because you're going to do a jam here in Vegas tomorrow, which we'll talk about for the Jim Irsay collection and what you're going to do there. But over the years, in addition to ZZ and, of course, your solo years and all that, you have jammed with so many people. Like, you're so open to jumping in with every genre of music. Even when you look at people you've guested with, it's as wide as, like, Al Jorgensen to Nickelback, you know? <laughs> who, who has been some of the fa- your favorite people that you've had a chance to jam with outside of the band over the decades? Well, anybody that knows three chords we we <laughs> we, we keep it it's, it's like uh, okay the fourth chord is not allowed if they know three chords and if they can get me out of uh, a, a night of rehearsal they're on so <laughs> well i saw i saw that you guys even in zz in the earliest years you said as long as you lay down a shuffle we can figure it out <laughs> that's about right and it still holds true is that right it yeah. was that was always the foundation right oh indeed but is there a moment, like, uh, even going back, I mean, earliest in your career with the, the moving sidewalks, I mean, you, Hendrix kind of took you under his wing a little bit, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, the, the Previous to ZZ Top, the outfit was uh, the moving sidewalks. Moving sidewalks, right. Who got invited to go on this tour with an Englishman. The manage, Our management company didn't really know... Uh, who who Jimi hendrix was they just said uh, hey you've got an invitation to join a tour with an english musician well at the time the english guys the british invasion shall we say was uh really in full swing and i it's fair to say that uh, Jimi hendrix may have uh, reached the zenith of all of that madness but we got to go uh we, we said yeah let's let's hit the road but in order to fin- in order to fulfill the contract, which is a forty minute set, we had to uh, we only we only had enough material to play, which included Foxy Lady and Purple Haze. And your set had that. And somebody said, "You're going to actually play that before Jimi Hendrix comes on." I said, "Well, we got to finish forty minutes." And I'll never forget the first night uh, I saw this figure in the shadows outside on the edge of the stage, and we uh, we did Foxy Lady and then Purple Haze. But on the uh, exit, uh, this guy grabs me and I spun me around. And he said, "I want to get to know you. You got a lot of nerve. I like that." <laughs> and it was none other than Jimi Hendrix. And that was the first encounter with him. Oh yeah, we we became p- pals uh directly that 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 evening we wound up uh, having to stay in the venue there was an upstairs dressing room we were hanging out and uh, that kind of started it got the ball rolling what were your impressions as like because obviously yourself and hendrix are among the great players ever but your styles are very different from what i as a novice and not being a guitar player listening would, would think what were your thoughts when you first heard hendrix as a guitar player well i had a girlfriend living in london who actually laid hands on the first Jimi hendrix release are you experienced which had not yet hit the states and uh, she had the presence of mind to uh, uh, fold up an envelope and uh, post it i was living in california at the time and uh, this thing came up through the mail and uh uh the sidewalks uh we we huddled up around the turntable and played the sides off of this record in in utter disbelief saying where where do sounds like this emanate from it was really uh it was a mind blower it was a a, a true head turner like wow who i guess the story goes uh it would be fair to say that Jimi Hendrix 
cradled the Stratocaster and figured out how to do things on that guitar that I could pretty much guarantee the designers of the Fender Stratocaster never right. had a clue <laughs> exactly. that this was going to uh, sounds like this were going to emanate from that uh, classic instrument. Did you jam with them when you were on the road together? Yeah, yeah. There, in fact, there was one night in Phoenix. Um, we ha- we were we had to stay. There was some hiccup. We had to stay in the venue for three hours after the show had closed. And uh, the, behind the stage, we discovered there were there were uh, there were giant sheets of paper. I guess they uh, they were used for for billboards along the highway. And uh, in a closet, we discovered gallon jugs of fluorescent paint. And uh, Hendrix figured out a way to wad up. Uh, we watered up some sheets of newspaper, rubber banded it to the to the headstock of the guitar, and we we cranked up the amplifiers, feedback city, and we we're splashing fluorescent paint over these uh, giant wall space uh, uh, canvases, I guess you'd call it. And of course, we uh, the the good news is that there were black lights above the stage, oh, so wow. it it became the psychedelic jam session. <laughs> <laughs> if there was only video, yeah, oh, if there was yeah. only audio, if there was any, do you have audio of yourself playing with Jimmy? There's there's a couple of yeah yeah there's a couple from uh, 1968. That was 1968. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, moving sidewalks. I may have said moving pictures. That's a rush record when I started talking about that. But uh, uh, I, I got I got uh, confused there. When you you know when you look to Z, when you move to you form ZZ Top. The other thing I was always curious about: first two records do okay, but not great. It's really the third record where really things take off for the band. Was there? Oh, you showed me a picture. Wow, this is. There was the moving sidewalks with oh wow with the with Jimi Hendrix. Show that to the camera if you can get a shot of that. That's amazing. Can you, Billy? When you when you're doing ZZ Top after the first two records, going into the third album, Trace Ombres, was there pressure on the band because the first two records didn't have a a big hit or sell like the label wanted? Were you guys feeling pressure going into album three? Well, album three. It's funny you should bring that up. It's it's a, a rather salient point because album number three, Trace Ombres, right. followed uh, one of ZZ Top's first uh, live appearances outside of Texas. Uh, I should say. Well, we had done a few things around Louisiana, Mississippi, but a good buddy of mine was uh, he was. Uh, at the at uh, Memphis State up in Memphis, Tennessee, and I had sent him uh, a copy of uh, the first album, and uh, I, I said, "You deserve to get one of the first copies off the press." I said, "One of the songs included on the on this first record was inspired by a telephone call." He held the phone up to his little record player playing a, a Peter Green blues number, which became uh, the inspiration for a ZZ Top song. And uh, I guess it was uh, shortly thereafter, uh, my buddy said, hey, man, he said, uh, I was playing your record, and uh, my pal is organizing a, a blues festival. And he heard your record, and he, he thought that you guys should come up and, and play the blues festival, which we did. And after the show was uh, concluded, we were met by some of the local Memphis, uh, the Memphian guys, uh, uh, Jim Dickinson, Lee Baker, and the famous Robert Johnson, the white Robert Johnson. And uh, they said, man, you guys are, are tearing it up. Uh, why, why don't you come and make a record here in Memphis? Uh, we'd love to have you guys up here. And I said, well, I said, we've, we've been doing okay. Uh, uh, we got a nice little studio in Texas, and I said, uh, "What would what would bring us up to Memphis?" And they said, "Well, there's a band that you may know that's making some headway, 
and uh, you could probably get some good sounds like they're doing. I said, who's the band? They said, this group called Led Zeppelin. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I said, well, we know about Led Zeppelin. I said, let's bring them, bring ZZ up there, which we did. And uh, So wait, Zeppelin was recording in Memphis? Yes. And and that what 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 year would this be about? Nin- 1973. Okay, so it was later in their career. They had th- that was probably what around Led Zeppelin 3 perhaps. 3, yeah. Probably oh. 3, maybe 4, I don't know the exact, but around there, yeah, wow. But so did you go there and meet them? We did and uh, we met uh, John Fry who was uh, running Ardent Recording Studios which was uh, the headline uh, guys was uh, John Hampton, Joe Hardy, and Terry Manning. They were the three top engineers, and they were all working overtime. And uh, what we heard was enough to convince us, hey, let's come up here and make a record, which resulted in uh, ZZ Top's first top 10, LaGrange. Right, all right, that's amazing. <laughs> Did you ever tour with Zeppelin? Or have much interaction with them? We no, uh, we never toured with Led Zeppelin. In fact, I'm not, I'm not familiar with. I don't know if anybody ever toured with Led Zeppelin. Uh, Maybe early on. Well, I think. Well, you're right because Zeppelin probably always headlined because they opened for like Vanilla Fudge early on. They were where I think they were the openers. You're right. Before they broke. Yes. Very early on, but you're right. I don't really know. If Zeppelin carried, I, I I never had a chance to see Zeppelin. I was a little too young, but I, I don't know if Zeppelin ever carried support. I think they always just did their own shows. Once the once it exploded for them, right? They just went out and and did it, and uh, man, did they ever do it! It was you know the, the uh, epic tales of of their of their live performances resound even today. I mean, it's it's pretty pretty cool yeah no doubt when things exploded for zz top i mean the way i look at that you had a lot of records out but eliminator was the one that was the game changer and went to a whole different level a lot of it driven by mtv new channel at the time you guys did those amazing videos i worked in a record store i was a kid working in a record store out of high school when eliminator came out and billy i can tell you we were selling them so fast that we didn't even take them out of the box. We get the box of vinyl, the box of cassettes, and we put a, a sticker on it. Here it is, five ninety nine, and we put it on the counter. And like they literally hotcakes, like for the longest time, just kept going and going and going. How did that impact you guys? Like on the inside, like were you prepared for that? Did you see that coming? Uh, we didn't, but you're right. Uh, I would say that Eliminator was one of the m- major turning points. Uh, for ZZ Top, uh, who had been uh, the little old band from Texas, and uh, we got uh, we got uh, the call. Warner Brothers uh, by this time said uh, we'd like a new record, and uh, there there was no real pressure uh, as far as far as a release date or we need this next week. So we were at that time we had by this time we had moved. To Memphis, we had become uh, a kind of uh, honored sons. Uh, T for Texas, T for Tennessee, but uh, it was uh, it was the th- the three engineers, Hampton, Hardy, and Terry Manning, uh, that uh, that allowed us to start fooling around with some of these crazy contraptions that were making musical sounds. Uh, and it, I think it would be fair to say 1983 was a, uh, not it was a big turning point in the musical industry. A lot of the music manufacturers were they're ravenous to trying to figure out, well, what can we invent that still makes music that uh, is new and exciting? And uh, John Fry, the owner of Arden Recording Studios, was not shy. He bought one of everything that showed up. Uh, and it wound up in the studio of course uh the 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 object was to uh throw away the manual immediately don't read the manual just start turning knobs <laughs> and as soon as you get to a, a sound that that seems to make sense and that's what we did we just uh, kind of played it by ear so as a guitar what's interesting about this 
And for those that don't know how big younger people may be, how big Eliminator was and still is, uh, again, the music videos are legend. But the thing about it is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Eliminator has the distinction of being incredibly rare feat, a diamond record which is sold in excess of 10 million copies in America alone, which very few bands have. But um, as a guitar player, these new sounds, synthesizers, the stuff that's going on, you embraced it or were you hesitant about it? Because I've talked to a lot of guitarists. People talk about when Eddie Van Halen went to keyboards on Jump or Rush, I mentioned earlier. They started bringing in keys around that same time. You talk to like Alex Lifes and he's like, man, I was worried about my guitars going away and I was threatened by it. It sounded like you embraced it. You were into it. We did as as uh, kind of a, a solid platform. Uh, we then got to ba- uh, tiptoe in and uh, the guitar remained uh, uh, first and foremost. There was another uh, noted producer that worked in and out of Memphis, Jim Dickinson, the late Jim Dickinson. And uh, I remember him smiling and he said, yeah, he said, uh, you haven't lost that, that, uh, the roots of the blues. And he said, uh, he said, them guitar licks are, are sitting on, on top of the world. He said, some of the sounds underneath it are, uh, fresh and new. He said, uh, but you bring it all back home by playing them licks. <laughs> I said, okay, great. When you have a record that big, what's it like trying to follow it? Because now the world wants another one, and nobody can do hard. I don't think anybody's ever replicated back-to-back 10 million selling records. So the subsequent records did well, but obviously nothing at that level, which would be impossible to achieve again. But but how were you guys feeling coming off of Eliminator after all the touring, millions of records, faces or household names, the beards, the videos, MTV? What What was it like going in? The next record was Afterburner, right? Yes, but I'll take a page out of your book. When you mentioned the magic of MTV, uh, it was so new and so fresh. In fact, <laughs> there's an unusual uh, a story about ZZ Top and MTV. Uh, Dusty and I were sitting at home, and, and uh, we both received a phone call from uh, our fair drummer, Frank Beard, the man with no beard. And uh, <laughs> he said, hey, man, he said... Uh, are you guys tuned in? He said, there, there's a really interesting concert uh, on being broadcast. Uh, he said, it's really strange. I've been watching it now for about three hours, and it's still going on. <laughs> so uh, Dusty and I both tuned in out of curiosity, and another three hours had gone by. I finally called Frank back, and I said, w- when, is this, when is this concert? Where it? He, we didn't know. And finally... Uh, you know the light bulb went off oh it's a 24-hour new music tv channel right (laughs) it would not stop so uh, that was our introduction to mtv yeah and that was obviously a big driver but but going you making the follow-up to eliminator making afterburner were you going into that what did you feel pressure was the label on you were you like here you like you said you're the little old band out of texas now all of a sudden you've got a record that millions of copies and worldwide and everybody knows your face is like how did you guys process that as a band how did you handle it well it was a the pressure was on you're absolutely correct uh we were getting uh uh demands from top to bottom the record company was pleased and yet they said hey uh all right you did it so uh, let's do it again the question became how how do you do it again and i think that uh i think that the the i think the the safety net for zz top was the fact that uh, memphis was uh such a relaxed place to be working in that uh, environment was a delight and uh, the d- despite the fact that uh, all of this pressure was looming all we had to do was uh, we sent out down the street for uh, mexican food and, and barbecue uh laying around the studio there uh which was so uh ahead of the game and at the same time uh the the surroundings were very very uh very much uh, inviting. Mm. So 
we we had a pretty good uh, uh, leg up on uh, getting to do what we get to do. And um, as you mentioned, Afterburner, the follow up, it was kind of funny. What is Eliminator? Well, it's the it's the fastest car at a drag race. At the end of the day, Top Eliminator was you know that was that was the end of the end of the day, and that that was it. But uh, they said, well, man, uh, how do you top that? And I said, well, br bring on a jet car and turn on the afterburner. There you go. <laughs> so, so we, we uh, but there there was some great stuff on uh, afterburner, a Velcro fly, planet of women, uh, uh, this fun stuff. What came first, the Eliminator car or the name for the record? The Eliminator car. You had the car already. The car had just been released. Uh, we had been working on it with uh, uh, Buffalo Motor Cars out of Paramount, California. And it was uh, Tim Newman who was uh, uh, taking the reins to be the director for these new things called MTV videos. He said, man, he said, I'm a hot rod nut. He said, I've been hearing about this uh, little red car uh, uh could could we include it in the record somehow and and uh i said yeah what do you have in mind he said well he said uh uh let's he said see if you can talk the talk the uh, talk your way into putting a a, vi a a visual on the cover of the record and of course that led to well what is this and and it was oh it's top eliminator and they said well how about just eliminator? And I said that that's fine by me. So it was actually it was actually uh, Tim Newman who saw the light, and he said, "Man, he said we can do that. Can we?" He said, "Does the car run?" I said, "Well, so far, I said I need to I need to con I need to finish paying for it. Maybe they'll give me the keys." <laughs> You know, I'm jumping around here. There's so much I want to talk to you about, and the audience would love to ask you a few questions, too. But I, one other thing about the old days, you mentioned Frank Beard, the only guy without a beard, which is always a running joke and, and okay. funny. But when you guys took a break, the story of the beards went that you guys took a break and you all went your separate ways for a couple of years. And then when you reconvened a couple of years later, you and Dusty had grown beards just because you were like checked out and being lazy or what have you. And, and Frank didn't. But the initial idea for the for letting the beard go was to be more of a disguise because you've become pretty popular. Then is that accurate? That is very accurate. Uh, we we had wrapped up a tour in, at the end of the bicentennial year, nineteen seventy six, and we were uh, we were required to remain off the stage and out of the recording studio, and. Uh, Warner Brothers was uh, waiting in the wings. They wanted to sign ZZ Top to uh, the label. And, uh, it, of course, the story now is, is kind of funny. They said, what made you grow these these uh, chest-length chin whiskers, these doormats? I said, well, we got it simple. We got lazy. We threw the razor away. And just recently, someone pointed out there is one and one and only photograph with the man with no beard frank beard is actually seen on the pullout sleeve of the first record uh, delivered to warner brothers which was de guayo 1979 1980 and uh once the uh call said okay you guys got to get back together and uh Let's let's uh, reconvene in the studio, and when we showed up, uh, there we were. And uh, of course, uh, Dusty and I had uh, we had we had a little bit of a lead on Frank, and he kind of threw in the towel. He said, ah, "I can't catch up with you guys. I'm I'm out." And uh, the photographer on hand, Mr. George Craig, said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute. I gotta I gotta capture this moment." So. Uh, for those out there that are uh, vinyl junkies, if you go and find a uh, copy of ZZ Top's De Guayo, uh, originally released in uh, 1980, don't miss uh, pulling off the shrink wrap. Pull out the inner <laughs> sleeve and there you'll see it. <laughs> the great irony of all this to me is that the beards were 
to create a disguise and some anonymity after you had become successful. However, in the end, they've done the complete opposite. Uh, yeah, it, be- it flipped. It became <laughs> it a trade. Completely trademark. flipped. Because I've told you this many times. If you wanted total anonymity, if you shaved that thing, nobody would know who you were. You could <laughs> yeah. walk down the strip right now and you're in Vegas and not one person would stop you if you lost the beard. So it, it did the complete opposite. It became the most identifiable trademark thing about you. It yeah. backfired. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we still um, we still get one day a year where we're 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 free to go out and that's halloween <laughs> right, so said, right. hey man you look like that zz top guy you're gonna win the contest <laughs> did they ever license a zz top uh, halloween costume did they, did it was there actually one like an official one just this last uh last halloween is that right yeah you could <laughs> you for yeah you could be zz top for a night <laughs> that is awesome that is so great all right let's talk about some it, and last thing on that is it true the old story that everybody always heard that you were once offered a million dollars to shave it is that true it is who it, offered that it's true uh now gillette uh would would deny it but uh they're they're sitting in the office smiling because when we when we declined the offer uh they didn't have to pay it and uh, we got to continue on being zz top <laughs> It was crazy. Was was Frank quickly trying to grow a beard so he had the option to shave it off to make a million? I'm going to ask him. There, there's, there's, if I was Frank, I'd be like, I'm not shaving. I'll see in two years. Give me a. If the tale be told, he said, "Hold off on that. Hold on a second. Let me let me see what." Why I can. did you pass on doing it? I mean, you could always grow it back. Uh, it was just, uh, is it corporate? Because they were going to use it for advertising, that sort of thing. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Just didn't feel right. Yeah, we just kept on going. Ah, that's amazing. Let's talk about what you're doing here in town. You're here in Vegas uh, where you you also have a home. And I know that uh, tomorrow is this Jim Irsay event. Uh, for those that don't know, Jim Irsay is the owner of the Indianapolis Colts. He is a huge collector of music stuff, sports stuff. He's putting his exhibit out here tomorrow in Vegas at the uh, Expo Center. And it's going to end with a jam, which I understand you're playing. And it's also a tribute to David Crosby. Uh, in terms of the material being played. What can you tell us about what you're doing tomorrow? Yeah, uh, well, let's start with uh, Jim Irsay and his his uh, remarkable uh, uh, admiration for all things sports, rock and roll. He has uh, managed to assemble a collection of some of the iconic uh, visuals of everything that uh, makes sense within those two genres and uh, he is a genuine uh, aficionado from top to bottom uh this uh exhibition allows uh, anyone that uh, shares that same passion to come see it in person uh, ringo Starr's first drum kit from the beatles uh he's got uh he's got the original uh, manuscript from of the uh, of the great hippie Bible from the '60s on the road by Jack Kerouac on display. Uh, this is a pretty remarkable uh, traveling museum, I should say. Right, and it's uh, topped off with a great musical event. Um, and as you said, uh, by including uh, David Crosby, Stephen Stills volunteered to show up so it's it's going to be a, a pretty interesting uh, gathering yeah i'm looking forward to checking it out i've heard a lot about this collection and uh i actually was supposed to leave town but i'm actually going to stay till early next week so that i can come and, and see it because i want to be able to talk about it too i i reached out to uh, his pr people as well because i think it's be amazing guy to talk to about his story about how he got so into collecting this stuff I mean, don't lock the door to your house here in las vegas until you go and see this thing it's uh it, it's it's a collection that it, it really challenges somebody to leave and try and describe it yeah it's really it's really remarkable yeah i'm looking forward to it and of course looking forward to hearing uh you play with the the band that's going to be assembled there um the zz top documentary that came out a few years ago were you happy with it well at the onset, I was very curious, and I approached the director 
uh, with a challenge. I said, you know, I said, uh, I, 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 I hear what you're proposing. I said, uh, every story has an ending. And I said, I want you to know that uh, uh, if we get into this uh, documentary with you, I said, don't end the band for us. <laughs> I said, we're still going. He said, listen, we'll get to that. He said, I totally get it. And um, uh, but by the end of the day, uh, he really dug deep. And uh, he managed to to uh, uh, bring, uh, he, he's, he's shining a light on ZZ Top from its very humble first beginnings up to the present day. It's, it's still going on. Yeah, I know Sam and Scott who worked on it, and I thought they did an amazing job. I thought it was a really well-done doc. My only criticism about it is I could have used it another hour longer because I was so into the story, and there's so much in over 50 years, you can't do it all in 90 minutes. And then the other thing that was so great in it was the gem uh, footage, which then later more recently became the album Raw, which is out now, which essentially serves as the soundtrack to the documentary, right? Indeed. Uh uh the discussion of uh a part two is still on the table for the doc yeah oh that'd be great and uh as everyone knows the uh the passing of uh, our fearless bass player for 50 years dusty hill said uh you know he said uh, uh i'm feeling a little out of sorts i said well health is number one i said go go check it out he said well uh if i'm late coming back he said uh you know, we got a guy that's been a family member for well over three decades. He said, give my guitar to Elwood, Elwood Francis. And uh, I said, yeah, okay. Sure enough, um, Elwood uh, accepted uh, the you know, passing of the torch was not an easy thing to uh, grab a hold Especially of. Especially because you guys went for like 50 years, never changing lineup. Nobody does that. Oh, yeah. Nobody. But here's uh, here's a guy that uh, uh, who uh, upon a, his initial arrival years and years back, uh, he had an avocado sandwich in one hand, skateboard under the other arm, uh, clean shaven. And who's for, this you're talking about now? Elwood. Elwood. Francis. Who's doing? Who's in the band now? Uh, he was hired on as uh, guitar tech, and uh, I never knew him to have whisker one <laughs> so here uh here we finally got the word hey uh the curtain is lifting it looks like uh, bands are allowed to uh, regather and hit the road uh and i said gee whiz i said we better hold a rehearsal we haven't hit a lick in 18 months and uh upon arrival at the uh, studio I, I grabbed one of the technicians and i said by the way i said Who's the new guy? And they said, w which one? I said, that guy over there with the long beard, the beard as long as mine. They said, that's Elwood. I said, no, no. I said, that guy. And they said, yes, believe it or not, Elwood has sprouted chin whiskers. So uh, not only did he pick up the bass and uh, played the sides off of it, he, he, uh, he too threw the razor away. So... Mm. We got the guy. Uh, one one thing on Dusty, and I don't know if, if this is something that's been revealed or is okay to talk about, but did he did what he pass away from? Has that been made public? What, what, how why he he passed? What you know what what it was? Well, we should make it public now. You know, uh, such a great guy. Um, he had had uh, his ups and downs. He had had bouts uh, with different health issues, and. Um, I, I think that that gosh he, he had just uh, he'd got he had just worn out and uh, maybe it's a maybe it's a gift uh, he went home went to sleep and then lights were out mm. so uh, it wasn't some protracted weird thing that uh, kept him on the ropes he he was uh, he played right up till the end uh, we should be so lucky. Do you remember the very last show you played with him? I mean, obviously you didn't know it was going to be the last show at that point, but was there any signs or anything in that performance that told you that he was not doing well? Well, he, we were up in uh, Indiana, and uh, we were getting ready to go on, and uh, he said, gee whiz, he said, uh, let's do this thing. He said, I will tell you, he said, I'm, I'm, 
I'm really kind of feeling out of sorts. I, I can't put my finger on it. I said, well, uh, should, should we, uh, should we let you, uh, should, should we try? I said, uh, you know, there's 30,000 people out there waiting to hear you blast it out. He said, oh, let's, let's go on and do it. He said, uh, but I said, well, look, uh, at the conclusion of the show, I said, let's talk about it, which we did. And, uh, we we had a uh, gosh it was a show uh, before a, we had a 10 day break i said look don't worry about it we got some time off and uh he said yeah yeah he, i said go go see the physician let them let them uh give you the once over so uh again uh maybe it's uh a, it was at that moment, it was a blessing in disguise. You mm. know, whatever whatever it was ailing him, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, it was kind of hidden out of sight. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the good news is we've we've got uh, a good five decades of great memories, <laughs> no doubt, and music, of course, and. Uh, I've not seen the band yet with Elwood, but everybody says the band sounds phenomenal. You guys have done a lot here in Vegas. You do a residency. As I mentioned, you have a home. You covered Viva Las Vegas with ZZ Top. Oh, yeah. Which is a great version and video, I think. Uh, why'd you decide to do that song of all the Elvis songs? Uh, well, at the time, uh, uh, Warner Brothers came to us and they said, we'd like to assemble a collection and we're going to call it ZZ Top's Greatest Hits. And uh, shortly thereafter, they said, well, we got a problem. They said, uh, uh, the radio people, uh, they said, yeah, it would be an interesting collection. It'd be a nice assembly of familiar material. And they said, but that's the problem. We've played these songs time and time again. Uh, we would we would take the record if you give us greatest hits plus two which was kind of our inside joke i said uh two maybe hits <laughs> <laughs> but uh i was driving back from nashville into memphis with uh uh another uh, kind of uh standby member of uh, the studio scene carl marsh and i came up with the song gun love uh was uh kind of an oddball track that uh made the grade and then uh i said gee was what what could we how could we add one more oh wait a minute dusty's a big fan of elvis maybe i could persuade him to do an elvis presley number and i went through the catalog there's so much you know the the elvis presley catalog is so giant but i said wait a minute viva las vegas uh Maybe I could persuade Dusty to sing it. Um, I, I, I'll work on it. So I prepared the track, and we were, uh, this is very interesting. We were playing a closing night of a very long tour, and it happened to un be unfolding in Shreveport, Louisiana at the Hirsch Coliseum. We got out of the out of got off the stage, and I said, "Hey, Dusty," I said, uh, "I got a recording set up in the dressing room. C could you sing an Elvis Presley number for me?" He said, "Oh, gee," he said, "I'm, we're, I'm, you know, there's no air conditioning in this building. We're all worn out. We're tired. Uh, I think I'll have to pass." And I said, "Well, you know," I said, uh, "I've got the uh, I've got the setup in the dressing room, the last dressing room where Elvis Presley changed costume." He said, really? I said, yeah. I said, you could sing, sing it in the same dressing room as Elvis. He said, let's go do it. I said, all right, it's Viva Las Vegas. He goes, I know it backwards and forwards. <laughs> so you cut the vocal in Elvis's room? In Elvis's dressing room. We cut it to a DAT recorder. Right. Uh, I had a set of earphones and a little Shure 57 microphone. Music in one one ear. Dusty's vocal on the other, and that became the that became the, he did it one take.
Wow. And then you just drop that vocal into everything you had been doing anyway. Oh, yeah. And there's the song for the hits record, which went on to do really well. It the really video, did. the single the version of it did really well. I had to ask you about that, given that we're in Vegas and uh, you're about to play here. And again, you've done residency and all of that. Speaking of, uh, we should mention ZZ Top, a great double bill with Leonard Skinner going out uh, July into the summer. I just saw Skinner here in Vegas about a month ago. They played at uh, the Virgin. And I just I just love, and I said to these guys, I mean, I know Gary's not going to play. Damon's in there now. Damon Johnson on guitar does a phenomenal job. Skinner, when you go see him, the way they handle their legacy, obviously there's, you know, Ricky's been there forever, but there's no technically original guys if Gary's not playing. But they do it so respectfully. They come out three songs into the set, and Johnny says to the crowd, we're paying tribute to the music of Leonard Skinner. They put the people who passed up on the screen. You know, Johnny is, you know, singing for his brother. I mean, they they handle it so brilliantly, and it still sounds so good. And you guys do the same thing with the ZZ Top legacy. You know, obviously, you're still, you know, two-thirds of the original guys, but still, it's done so well. I think it's going to be an amazing double bill. I can't wait. Yeah, the the notion of a Leonard Skinner meets uh, ZZ Top uh it holds promise to be one of the great tickets for for this particular coming outing uh the amount of songs everyone's going to know between the two bands is oh, insane as you point out they do it and do it right yeah uh, they uh uh and gosh what's not to love about uh, a ZZ Leonard Skinner bill. That's great. That's I, a good combo. I can't wait for, for that to start. And you're going to be doing some ZZ shows without them as well. I know you've got a lot of, uh, of, other, of other stuff going on. Last thing, and then I'm going to take a break, and then we'll do one more segment, and I'll let you go if that's cool. Because sure. the audience would love to talk to you, and I promised them I'd let them call in and say ask you a question. But last time we spoke, which was not that long ago on the phone, on the, here on this radio show, you were just getting ready to go out and do some dates, and Jeff Beck was going to be on some of the bill with you. And little did we know at that time that that was going to be the end for, for Jeff and uh, obviously major tragedy and loss there. But what was the experience like those last few shows you got to do with Jeff and to see him and play with him again? Well, it was a uh, rekindling of a longstanding friendship. I met Jeff Beck when I was 17. And uh, just recently, someone uh, was kind enough to present me a uh, one of those rainbow-colored show posters. It was announcing the Jeff Beck Group featuring the Moving Sidewalks, 1968. My gosh, Beck and Hendrix. I mean, you were like, like yeah. that's just crazy. Yourself, of course, that's nuts. So we, we've uh, enjoyed a friendship uh, that lasted, uh, and, and again, uh, I got to say that uh, uh, Jeff was fortunate to do what he loved doing the most. Well, uh, there were two things, wrenching on a hot rod and slamming on a, on a guitar. Yeah. And uh, uh, we miss him dearly, uh, needless to say. Uh, but we got to uh, join uh, forces right up till the end yeah and uh uh it, it was it was it was just wonderful yeah and and as a guitar player i don't play i'm just a fan i know what i like what i hear but in all the guitar players i've spoken to in all the decades i've been doing this they all say jeff beck is the guy he seems like he's the guitar player's guitar player even the most accomplished players when you talk to them they all kind of no beck beck is the guy what how do you as a guitarist yourself how do you kind of summarize jeff beck as a player and the impact he had on you yeah the admiration runs deep there is a move afoot uh, to uh, organize a tribute concert uh being headed up by none other than eric clapton um who uh sent the word out to uh, Jimmy Page I mean I mean the 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 number of of notable guitar players that 
to this day hold an admiration for Jeff Beck and his accomplishments is just astounding. But uh, it looks like uh, toward the end of May, the Royal Albert Hall will open its doors to allow this uh, tribute to Jeff Beck to take place. I've accepted the invitation. In fact, I told the organizer, I said, well, it's great. I said, uh, I said I'd be delighted to play a couple of Jeff Beck numbers. I said, uh, you're going to have to get uh, one, maybe two, maybe three more guitar players uh, to join in to cover what Jeff Beck could do by himself. Mm. <laughs> So and there is uh, probably right in that statement is the brilliance that he could he could make one, a single guitar sound like four. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. All right, let's do a break, and then when we come back, we'll have a few more minutes here with Billy, who's been kind enough to join us here on Trunk Nation, Faction Talk One Hundred Three, or of course the Sirius XM app. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, enough from me. I could talk to Billy for hours and hours. I promised the audience a chance to say a quick hello. So before he gets out of here, we'll grab some calls for the great Billy Gibbons. Live on this Friday, Trunk Nation will be right back. I'll see you